very good evening to all my dear friends who have joined here through this uh, youtube channel today we are going to have a continuation of our cardiology discussion by dr rashmi ma'am thank you ma'am for joining with us today and today it's going to be very important topic for the discussion that is the ischemic heart diseases i hope that you already saw the first topic of this cardiology series where she has already taken a discussion on ecg and uh, basics of cardiology so if, if you haven't seen you after this topic please go and see so that it will give you a basic idea of the ischemic heart disease thank you so much ma'am for joining with us today now i hand over the session to you ma'am yeah thank you very good evening to all of you I am very happy to be back with another topic. This is very, very important. If, uh, as I always tell you, whether it is for the NEET PG or for the next or for your final year exams or for your clinical practice, this is a very, very important topic. If you are going to finish your uh, MBBS and practice as a medical officer, this is most important topic that you should be aware because most of you will be posted in the emergency or in the ICU. It will be very, very helpful for you in your clinical practice. So, what I'm going to focus is majorly the, uh, second, is majorly the basics that we are going to focus on. So if you're clear with the basics, you can actually build up upon the topic and you can learn through mo many more sources. Okay. And in the future, we can post some more videos on more complex issues also. Okay. So let us start now. So what is ischemic heart disease? What do you think is ischemic heart disease? I would like all of you to interact with me so that it will be a good discussion. Okay, it's not going to be one-way teaching. Okay, so I, I would like all of you to interact with me in the live chat. Okay, so before we go in, we'll just, as usual, begin with a question for which we'll discuss the answer later. Okay, so a 75-year-old lady comes to the OP with complaints of worsening fatigue, shortness of breath on exertion, and lower limb swelling since three weeks. She's a known hypertensive and, and hyperlipidemia patient. She gives his of one episode of excessive sweating and nausea the previous week while she was trying to lift a very big box. There was no history of chest pain, palpitations or shortness of breath at that point of time. She is a teetotaler. Her vitals were normal. Pulse was 80 per minute. BP was 142 by 80 millimeters mercury. Examination showed prominent JVP. The JV pulsations were uh, elevated. Pedal edema was there. An additional heart sound is heard after the S2 with bilateral basal crepitations and or auscultation. Echo showed dilated left ventricle with increased end diastolic volume with regional wall motion abnormality over the anterolateral left ventricular wall. And the EF was 34%. So which of the following best describes this patient condition? Is it long-standing uncontrolled hypertension, ischemic heart disease, repeated vasoconstriction of the pulmonary vessels, alcohol consumption, or infection with a single standard RNA virus? So I would like all of you to go through these options. I don't want you to say it is ischemic heart disease just because the topic is ischemic heart disease. I would like to know how you people have arrived at that answer. Okay, just keep it in mind and post your answer so that we can discuss later. Okay, so what exactly is ischemic heart disease? What do you think is ischemic heart disease? Sorry, just a minute. Can you see my screen? Is the screen visible? No, ma'am. It's not visible. Just a minute. Yes, ma'am. It's visible now. No? Yeah. Okay. So what exactly is ischemic heart disease? Ischemic heart disease is the decreased delivery of oxygen to the myocardium. What is it? It is a decreased delivery of oxygen of O2 to the myocardium. Okay. So when can the myocardium be deprived of the oxygen? When is it exactly deprived of oxygen? Either there can be decreased blood flow or there is complete absent absence of blood flow. Either there can be decreased blood flow or there can be complete absence of blood flow. In these two conditions, there is some ischemia to the myocardium. There is decreased delivery of oxygen to the myocardium. So what happens is the uh, heart musculature suffers from ischemia. Okay, So ischemic heart disease is the decreased delivery of oxygen to the myocardium. It can happen either because there is decreased blood flow 
or there is complete absence of blood flow. Okay, do you get it? So when does this most commonly happen? In what condition? So when there is an atherosclerotic heart disease, most common reason is there is an atherosclerotic heart disease. Atherosclerotic heart disease. Okay. So what happens when there is a decreased oxygen supply to the musculature? So see, this is the blood vessel and there is a plaque here. Okay. There is a plaque here and blood flow is like this. But when there is a turbulence also because of the blockage. So what happens to the myocardium? There is decreased blood supply to the myocardium. So if there is decreased blood supply, what happens? Decreased oxygen delivery. So when there is oxygen delivery is less, what happens? ATP becomes less. The ATP produced is less. So when there is no ATP, there can be no depolarization. No depolarization of the muscular cells, of the neurons there. There can be no muscle, no depolarization. So what happens? Failure or ischemia happens. There is failure of the muscle to contract or there is ischemia. Okay. So when there is decreased blood flow, there is decreased oxygen delivery because of that. The ATP is reduced. There is no depolarization. So the muscle goes into ischemia. So this is very, very important. Okay. There is, there is ischemia when there is less ATP production. Okay. So what can happen? Can you find this ischemic heart disease? There can be two problems. As I told you, there can either be a decreased oxygen supply or there can be an increased oxygen demand. So when do you think the oxygen demand will increase? So if the, the blood can, the myocardium can either require a lot of oxygen, that is increased oxygen demand, but or, or otherwise the supply can be less. That These are the two conditions where you can have an ischemia, isn't it? So when the oxygen supply is less, like I told you, there is decreased blood flow or there is absence of blood flow. That is That can happen in atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis or there is an embolus or when there is an embolus or the vessel wall is inflamed, which is vasculitis, when the vessel is inflamed or there can be a vasospasm. You may, you may take some drugs which may cause vasospasm. So all these conditions, you know, cause the decrease in oxygen supply. So when do you think there is an oxygen demand, increase in oxygen demand? We studied in the last class during aortic stenosis that left ventricular hypertrophy is a very, very important important factor which causes increased oxygen demand. Okay, left ventricular hypertrophy increases the oxygen demand. Also, when there is tachycardia, the oxygen demand increases. One more most important thing, then there is exertion or exercise. Okay, when there is exertion or exercise, the oxygen demand in the myocardium is more. Okay, so we have very easily now studied the causes for the ischemic heart disease. See, we have now arrived at the causes for the ischemic heart disease. It can either be atherosclerotic or there can be an embolus or there can be a vessel inflammation, which is vasculitis. There can be vasospasm, a left ventricular hypertrophy, tachycardia, exertion. All these either increase the oxygen demand or decrease the oxygen supply. So what happens? The myocardium becomes ischemic. This is very, very important that you understand. This is a very basic concept and it will be very, very helpful in understanding the later concepts. Okay. So. We have now seen what is ischemic heart disease. So what do you think are the risk factors? So what do you think are the risk factors? So the risk factors can be modifiable or non-modifiable. The risk factors can be either modifiable or non-modifiable. So what are the non-modifiable risk factors that you think contribute to ischemic heart disease? So as the person's age increases, the person is more prone for ischemic heart disease because the atherosclerotic process happens more during the older age. Okay. So non-modifiable factors, the first one will be age. Okay. So non-modifiable factors, the first one will be age. Then if you have a family history, family history of ischemic heart disease, family history of ischemic heart disease or coronary artery disease, all these are non-modifiable risk factors. These are some of the non-modifiable risk factors. So what are the modifiable risk factors? Obesity, diabetes mellitus, controlling your hypertension, isn't it? All these are modifiable risk factors. Quitting smoking, quitting alcohol. So all these are the modifiable risk factors, which is in your hands for you to control all these things, isn't it? So what are the modifiable risk factors and non, what are the non-modifiable risk factors? So modifiable risk factors are obesity, 
diabetes, hypertension, smoking, alcohol, non-modifiable or increased age and family history of coronary artery disease. This is very, very important. Okay. So we have now seen what is, what is ischemic heart disease? How do we get ischemic heart disease? What happens in ischemic heart disease? And what are the modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors? Okay. So let's move on now. We'll see what all comes under acute coronary syndrome. So what do we mean by, what do we mean by acute coronary syndrome? We have learned many conditions like stable angina, unstable angina, prince metal angina, n STEMI and STEMI. There are five things. So what happens exactly in all these five things is what we need to learn now. Okay. So let's start. The first one is stable angina. So what happens in stable angina? See, this is the vessel wall. Okay. And this is the myocardium. There is a plaque here. There is a plaque here. But this plaque is very, very strong. The fibrous cap over the plaque. This is an atherosclerotic plaque. The fibrous cap is very strong. Fibrous cap is good. So what happens? Because the fibrous cap is good, the plaque does not rupture. No rupture. The plaque does not, the plaque does not rupture. This is called a stable plaque. Okay. Stable plaque. So this is a stable plaque. What happens? Because the fibrous cap is very, very strong. It is, is very, it is very strong. There is no rupture. So because there is no rupture, it is contained there and there is only some occlusion of the vessel wall happening. Okay. There is only occlusion of the vessel wall happening because of the plaque, but not because of the thrombus, which is formed later. Okay. So the fibrous cap, uh, fiber, fibrous cap and the plaque, what does it do? It occludes the lumen. So it actually reduces the lumen size. So if it is less than or equal to 70%, what happens? You have stable angina. What happens when the blood supply is occluded to less than 70%, you have stable angina. So what happens then? So the blood flow to the myocardium is reduced. Okay. So what happens? This is the epicardium. And you have the next this is the myocardium. And this is the endocardium. These are the layers of the heart. Okay. Epicardium, myocardium and the endocardium. So what happens? The blood flow is good here. But the blood flow becomes less in these places, in the endocardium. So there is subendocardial ischemia. I'm sure all of you have heard of this term, but you might not understand it at that point of time. So let me now explain this to you. This is called subendocardial ischemia, subendocardial ischemia. That is just above the endocardium, there is ischemia happening because of a stable angina. There is a plaque, which is a stable plaque. The fibrous cap is very strong. So there is some occlusion of the coronary vessel. Because of that, the blood flow to the myocardium is reduced and the endocardium is affected. Just above the endocardium, till that it is affected, there is subendocardial ischemia. Okay. Subendocardium ischemia is there. So what happens when there is exertion? When there is exertion, this, when there is exertion, the heart rate increases. So the blood flow becomes lesser. When the heart rate increases, the oxygen demand increases when the heart, when there is exertion, the heart rate increases, the oxygen demand is more, but this occluded vessel is not able to provide so much of oxygen to the myocardium. So what happens? The ischemia worsens. So what happens in these patients? They will have angina at, on exertion. Angina on exertion. So what is angina? Angina is the chest pain. Okay. Angina is the excruciating chest pain that the patient experiences when, when he is having this kind of an occlusive coronary. Okay. So this is stable angina. Stable angina, the plaque is stable. That is what you need to remember. So the second thing is unstable angina. What is stable angina? What is unstable angina? Okay. What is unstable angina? In this, yeah, one second. In this, what we see, there is a vessel, there is a plaque, but this plaque is not very strong. Okay. This plaque is not very strong. So plaque is not strong. Plaque is not strong. So what happens? It gives way and ruptures. This plaque will rupture. Okay. So this plaque, this fibrous cap and the plaque is not strong. So it ruptures. So what happens when it ruptures? All the platelets will start coming here. It becomes adherent to the adherent to the Atheroma, that is the plaque. Okay. So all, 
all the platelets come here and try to occlude the plate, uh, come here and adhere to the plaque. Okay. So what happens because of that? There is near total occlusion. What happens? There is near total occlusion happening. Near total occlusion happens. So what happens again here? There is subendocardial ischemia. Subendocardial ischemia is there here also. But there is no infarction. The muscle tissue remains intact. They are not dead. Their cells are not dying. Okay. There is ischemia, but this is for a shorter duration. The uh, plaque, I mean, the blood flow is trying to be restored to these parts. So this ischemia does not last for a long time to turn into infarction. Infarction happens when the cells actually die. Okay. So what happens? The plaque is not strong. So it ruptures. All the platelets come, try, come to adhere and try to occlude this process. So in, in that process what happens there is near total occlusion of the vessel okay near total occlusion of the vessel happens but there is still some amount of blood supply so that is why there is no infarction if the blood supply was totally cut off then there will be infarction because there is still some amount of blood supply say around 10 percent at least will be left okay so because of that near total occlusion there is subendocardial ischemia but there is no infarction so this patient will have angina at rest as well as rest plus exertion this patient will have angina at rest as well as on exertion. Okay. So next, we have seen about unstable angina and unstable angina. So what is NSTEMI? NSTEMI is non-ST elevation of MI. Okay. This is non-ST elevation MI. Non-ST elevation MI. So what happens in this? So you have a plaque. This has ruptured. Okay, this has given way. This plaque has ruptured. And this forms a thrombus. What happens? The platelets come here and they begin to form a thrombus. So what happens? Plaque gets ruptured. Then platelets come and adhere to this. Platelets come and adhere to that thrombus uh, to form a thrombus. Platelets come here and adhere to form a thrombus. What happens at that point of time? The blood flow is reduced. So blood flow is reduced. So when the ischemia time increases incre increases further, when the ischemia time increases further, what happens? The blood flow is lost. When the ischemia time increases further, there is infarction. Okay? There is infarction. Infarction. This is very, very important. In NSTEMI, you have infarction because a thrombus is formed which occludes the, occludes the uh, coronary completely. So because of that, what happens? The blood flow decreases and there is infarction. So this patient has angina at rest. This patient has angina at rest. Okay. This patient has angina at rest. This is very, very important. So in the, in what is the difference between unstable angina and STEMI? And STEMI, there the plaque ruptured. There was a thrombus, but there was only near total occlusion. It was not a complete occlusion. In this, there is total occlusion and there is infarction. In that, there was only subendocardial ischemia because still some amount of blood supply was trying to be retained. Okay, next. Next, we'll see about STEMI. What is STEMI? This is ST elevation MI. Okay, this is ST elevation MI. So, what happens like this? Again, the thrombus occludes the myocardium. Thr thrombus occludes the coronary. So, this is the vessel wall. So, the thrombus completely occludes. Occludes the vessel wall. Okay, so complete occlusion. Complete occlusion. In this, what happens? The entire myocardium is completely affected. Okay. This entire myocardium. In NSTEMI, some amount of myocardium will still be intact. But in NSTEMI, what happens is the entire myocardium will be affected. So this is called a transmural infarct. Okay. This is called a transmural infarct. So what is this? At rest, you will have angina. Angina at rest, which will not be relieved by anything. Okay, so there is 100% occlusion of the artery, coronary artery, because of that you have a transmural infarct. Okay, so there's complete occlusion. Stable angina, there is a stable plaque. The fibrous plaque does not allow it to rupture, get ruptured. So there is only some occlusion of the coronary. There is still blood flow, there is subendocardial ischemia. In an unstable angina, what happens? There is near total occlusion, but not total occlusion. So there will be uh, there will be subendocardial ischemia. Whereas in NSTEMI, what happens? There is a thrombus formation because of the plaque rupture. 
the platelets come, you form a thrombus. The thrombus completely occludes the vessel, but the ischemia time is less. Okay. So there is not a complete infarction, but some amount of myocardium gets infarcted. Okay. But what happens in STEMI? There is a complete occlusion and a transmural infarct. Okay. Transmural infarct is there producing angina at rest. Okay. So there is one more thing which we have to know that is vasospastic or prince metal angina. This is very commonly asked in your um, USMLE pattern type of questions. So you can expect this in your next as well. So this, what is vasospastic or prince metal angina? This is a very favorite question for the MCQ, MCQ examiners. Okay. So what is vas vasospastic or prince metal angina? So this is the myocardium and this is the coronary. So what happens? This coronary, there is an occlusion. There is a spasm. There is a spasm of the vessel. Spasm of the coronary. When does this happen? This spasm occurs mostly at night or early morning. This vasospasm occurs in patients predisposed. It happens mostly at night or in the early morning. So when this occlusion happens, what happens? Because of that, the blood supply gets reduced. Because of this spasm, the blood supply gets reduced. Okay. So in whom is this most common? This is most common in young females. Okay. Young females and those taking triptans. So you will get a question in your, uh, in your next or in your MCQ pattern. Like there is a 23-year-old girl who is suffering from migraine. She was taking sumatriptan on a regular basis. She is developing continuous, uh, she is developing episodes of chest pain at around 12 a.m. in the night. On awakening, she is all right. Or in the morning, during the day, she is completely all right. So what, what is this patient suffering from? So this is this patient is most likely having a prince metal angina or a vasospastic angina. This is most common at the night or in the early morning. Okay. This can actually cause a transmural ischemia. So there can be a transmural ischemia. Transmural ischemia. What happens in this? The ST elevation will be there because it is transmural. The ST segment will get elevated, but the trop troponins will not be proportional to that. The troponins will be negative. Okay. The troponins will be negative. And one more very, very important MCQ point that you should remember is this can be reproduced by taking, reproduced by giving acetylcholine. So if you give this, if the patient is normal during the day and you, you try, you want to try to induce this vasospasm in this patient, what you should give, you should give acetylcholine to this patient. And the patient will develop vasospastic angina. Then you confirm that this patient is suffering from prince metal angina. Okay. So how would you treat this? We can finish this off here itself. How would you treat this vasospastic angina? You give calcium channel blockers or nitroglycerin. Nitroglycerin. Okay. Nitroglycerin or calcium channel blockers. You, this can be given so that the vessels will dilate easily. Okay. So we have seen unstable angina, stable angina. Enstemi, STEMI, and vasospastic angina. You have to remember this is very common in young females and also those who are using triptans. There are some more risk factors, but these two are the most important and most relevant in the context of your exams. Okay. So this is very, very important. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Dinesh Rangan is asking me what is the difference between ischemia and infarct? Okay. Ischemia is the reduced blood supply. So there will be decreased oxygen in that place. But infarct is when the cells die. Okay, because of the lack of oxygen, because of the prolonged ischemia, what happens? The cells will die. Okay, the death of cells is called infarct. Okay, I hope this clears your question. Yeah, we shall continue. If you have any more doubts, you can just put it up there. I'll just answer this. Okay, so coming to the clinical features. So, what is the most important one? That is chest pain. What is this called? We call this angina. This is chest pain or angina. Okay. So when you ask the patient, how is your chest pain? What all, what are, what are all the attributes that you should think when you, when you talk, when you question the patient about asking his chest pain? Okay. What are all the points that you should consider? So what is the onset? How does it happen first? When is it occurring? What time of the day is it affecting you? And how long does it last? When and how? Okay. And how long does it last? How long does it last? How does it, how do, what do you do to relieve the pain? 
do you sit down when you are exerting does it happen do you sit down to give rest for the muscle to relax and the, does the pain reduce on relaxing do you have pain while walking uphill do you have pain while walking to the restroom do you have pain while sitting down do you have pain at sleep in the sleep time all those things are very very important questions that you should ask so what do you think precipitates or relieves this kind of pain okay so this is very very important and what is the quality of your chest pain is it a very uh, tight pain or do you have some burning sensation or do you have a squeezing type of chest pain like we already studied in the books they will say it's like an elephant is thumping on your chest isn't it so it's that kind of excruciating pain that the patient will experience okay and most important where is it getting radiated so where is it getting radiated radiation is very very important we all know even a common man knows when the left arm pains he will think he will say that i have to go get an ecg done okay why does this happen the left the myocardial pain actually radiates to the left shoulder the left arm or the left jaw and the left neck okay these are all the places where occasionally to the right side also it can radiate okay so this is what is called the radiation of pain why does this happen this happens because the nerves from the myocardium the nerves from the heart tissue as well as the nerves from the somatic areas go and synapse on the same region in the spinal cord okay from where it is carried to the brain because they synapse on the same region in the spinal cord this pain is actually referred to that place same region in the spinal cord so because of that what happens the pain is getting radiated you feel that this pain is felt here also okay that is because the somatic nerves also go and uh, synapse on the same place where the uh, nerves from the heart tissue also synapse in the spinal cord so because that is mostly in the cervical thoracic region so because of that there is angina there is radiation of pain where all does it radiate left shoulder then uh, left neck left jaw so very rarely the right right shoulder also okay that is because of the radiation then what is when do you have atypical chest pain i mean wait atypical mi atypical mi that is when there are no symptoms there are no sy symptoms okay there are no symptoms there is no chest pain there is no difficulty in breathing there is no leg swelling you don't have any of the symptoms of myocardial infarction when when does this happen this is because when the person is having autonomic neuropathy because of diabetes mellitus autonomic neuropathy because of diabetes mellitus or in very elderly patients okay or in very elderly patients what happens they are not able to perceive the pain okay so in diabetic patients because of autonomic neuropathy loss of the pain is there pain sensation is there so because of that the patient will be having a uh, stemi but they will have no symptoms absolutely okay so this is atypical mi okay so coming on to autonomic features we all know routinely we ask in history do you, when when the patient complains of chest pain we routinely ask did you have palpitations do you have sweating during that episode we all ask this very routinely but why does this happen why do we get autonomic features like i told you this is also because these autonomic fibers also go and locate in the same region okay so that's why we have autonomic features so what are the autonomic features that we have increased sweating what is that called diaphoresis what is that called diaphoresis so like the patient we had in the first uh, in the question that i had discussed first that is diaphoresis the patient had increase sweating at one one episode one episode was there so that is increased sweating then what is that feeling of impending doom this is a very very important sensation that the patient has this is feeling of impending doom some that something worst is going to happen to him this is called feeling of impending doom the patient will be very very scared okay so this is impending doom he will become very anxious also they can also have nausea and vomiting nausea and vomiting so the, what are the autonomic features we have we have seen diaphoresis sweating impending doom nausea or vomiting okay so the, these are all the autonomic features that the patient will also present with okay so if the patient is having a right ventricular mi or left ventricular mi how will you differentiate can you tell me like how will you differentiate whether the person is having a right ventricular mi or a left ventricular mi so let us now see what happens when there is a right ventricular mi okay so when there is a right ventricular mi what happens the right ventricle is not working right ventricle not working isn't it so when the right ventricle is not working what happens there is backflow of blood so what comes into the right atrium 
right atrium we have the svc and ivc so svc superior vena cava and the inferior inferior vena cava come into the right atrium and then from there it goes into the right ventricle so when the right ventricle is not functioning there is pooling of blood in the right atrium isn't it there is pooling of blood in the right atrium so when there is pooling of blood in the right atrium what happens it has to obviously transmit the pressure into the svc or the ivc isn't it so there is a there is uh, pressure in the ivc svc or the ivc so what happens because of that when the svc or ivc is affected when the svc there is engorgement of blood in the svc what we have we have the increased jvp elevated jvp will be that because of the increase in this um, svc pressure okay because of the increase in svc pressure we have elevated jvp so what happens when the ivc is elevated ivc there is pressure the pressure is increased what will happen the patient will have hepatomegaly hepatomegaly and pedal edema ascites so in the lower half you will have fluid accumulation there will be more blood flow so because of the increased hydrostatic pressure there will be blood leak fluid leak into the interstitial space so this hepatomegaly pedal edema or ascites so what have we seen there will be increased jvp hepatomegaly pedal edema ascites okay so what happens when there is when the right ventricle is not working what more happens there is less blood in the left ventricle so because there is less blood in the right ventricle there is less blood in the left ventricle also so because the pulmonary circulation is affected because the pulmonary backflow is reduced the left atrium gets less blood so the left ventricle also becomes lesser the left ventricle also receives less blood so because of this what happens the stroke volume decreases or the cardiac output decreases so when the cardiac output decreases what happens the patient will have hypotension okay so the patient will have hypotension isn't it so what happens increased jvp hepatomegaly pedal edema ascites patient will have hypotension hypotension so one more thing what will happen when do we say that the right ventricle is affected we say that when the rca is affected right coronary artery is affected the patient will have a right ventricular mi so what does this right right coronary artery supply it supplies the sa node as well as the av node the most importantly the av node also okay so when the av node is affected what happens there is bradycardia okay bradycardia or heart blocks okay bradycardia or heart block can occur okay so we have seen what all the right ventricular mi can produce so when the right ventricle is not working you have elevated jvp okay you have elevated jvp you have hepatomegaly you have pedal edema ascites hypotension bradycardia and heart block okay so this is all will this all will happen when the patient is having right ventricle mi okay when you understand this it, you don't have to mug up all the clinical features you can just say it as you think about think about the process in the mind you will get each and every clinical feature by yourself you don't have to mug it up okay Doctor X is asking for the ECG. Yeah, we shall discuss some ECGs in the end. Okay, so first, you, if you understand all this basic pathology, we can just discuss all the ECGs in the end. I'm coming to that. Okay, yeah. So the next thing is what happens when there is a left ventricle MI. Okay. So we have seen what all happens in a right ventricular MI. Now we come to what happens in a left ventricular MI. So in a left ventricle MI, what happens? Left ventricle is not working. Okay. left ventricle is not working so like we told you when the left ventricle is not left atrium left ventricle so what comes into the left atrium is the pulmonary vessels pulmonary vessels so when the left ventricle is not working what happens the blood gets accumulated in the pulmonary vessels the blood gets accumulated in the pulmonary vessels so what happens because of that the patient has pulmonary edema you will see many patients coming with pulmonary edema and you will find that the patient is having a steady a left ventricular wall myocardial infarction okay so the patient will have pulmonary edema okay so when the lv is not working what happens it becomes stiff it becomes more and more stiff okay the left ventricle becomes more and more stiff okay when the when it becomes more and more stiff the heart sounds will also be affected okay the heart sounds will also be affected you can get an s3 or an s4 okay you can get an s3 or an s4 okay so you will have pulmonary edema so in left ventricular wall mi you have the patient will have pulmonary edema and the patient will 
also have an additional S sound, uh, hard sound S3 or S4. Okay, we have an additional hard sound S3 or S4. So this is very, very important. This is very, very useful for you. If you learn the symptoms like this, you don't have to actually mug up all the symptoms. When, what happens when there is a, you have seen, what have you seen? What, has, what happens in chest pain? What are the characteristics that you should ask the patient? What about radiation? What, what is an atypical MI? What are the autonomic features associated with that? that then right ventricle wall MI and left ventricle wall MI. I hope you understand this. Okay. So now moving on to what happens. What are the consequences of this myocardial infarction? What happens when the patient is actually suffering from myocardial infarction? What happens in the immediate period during the little after the immediate period and what happens in the late period? Okay, so this is very, very interesting. I want you to listen to it. So it will be very interesting and you don't have to mug up all the complications. I would say these as consequences and later it will be complications. Okay, so consequences are very, very important. You don't have to mug this up. You can just listen to it. You will understand it so clearly. Okay, so let us start with that. So what happens when there is a MI? So what happens when there is an MI? Because of this MI, what happens? The cells become more permeable to sodium and calcium. Okay. The cells become more permeable to sodium and calcium. So what happens when they become more permeable to sodium and calcium? Because of this ischemia, they become more permeable. Okay. Then what happens? The cells get excited. The cells get excited. What happens when there is excitement? They get arrhythmias. Okay. Arrhythmias. Arrhythmias happen. So initially what do we see? We see a Premature complex, ventricular premature complex, this will move on to VT, then this can go on to V fib, ventricular fibrillation, and the patient can have sudden cardiac death. Okay. So the patient can have sudden cardiac death. We have seen patients with MI who go into sudden cardiac death and they say the patient developed an arrhythmia, he had ventricular fibrillation and he arrested. Okay. So uh, if the if the STEMI is so severe, then the patient can have arrhythmias very, very easily. They can have VPCs initially, then it can pro progress to VT and then ventricular fibrillation and the patient can have sudden cardiac death. So in the immediate period, what happens? In the 0 to 24 hours period, what happens? The patient can have arrhythmias. Okay. So the patient can have arrhythmias. He can have sudden cardiac death. Okay. So you have now known the complications which happen in the 0 to 24 hours period. So one more thing also happens in this period. What happens? There is acute heart failure. Okay. Acute heart failure is there. So what happens because of this acute heart failure? There is hypotension. I told you there is hypotension because of this heart failure. What will the patient have? He will have very cold extremities. Isn't it? He will have very cold extremities. So what is this condition called when the patient is having severe hypotension because of a cardiac cause? This is called cardiogenic shock. Okay, this is called cardiogenic shock. Okay, so what happens is an acute heart failure, there is hypotension. The and you have pulmonary edema. What is this pulmonary edema called, which happens immediate in the immediate period? What is that called? It is called flash pulmonary edema. It just happens like it's in a flash. Okay, so this is called flash pulmonary edema. So acute heart failure, there is hypotension, there is cardiogenic shock, there is pulmonary edema. So what happens in the first in the first 24 hours? There can be arrhythmias, there can be sudden cardiac death, cardiogenic shock, and flash pulmonary edema. We all know we tell the patients that the patient is still critical, though the patient may look all right. He may develop arrhythmias at any time. He can develop a second MI at any point of time. He can, he can have a sudden cardiac death. He can have a cardiac arrest at any point of time. He may develop severe hypotension and have cardiogenic shock as well as develop pulmonary edema, flash pulmonary edema. Okay. So now you know the consequences that can happen within 24 hours. Okay. So moving on, what happens in the next period? What happens when there's 24 hours to three days? 24 hours into three days, for two, three days. What happens? This is characterized by ruptures, okay? What is this mainly characterized by? Ruptures, okay? This is very simple. I'm telling you so that you can remember easily. So first, what first 24 hours, they're all the very, very severe complications. And what happens in the next, in the next three days? The patient will have a lot of ruptures. 
So what are all the things that can get ruptured? Okay, what are all the things that can get ruptured? So let us draw the heart. Okay, so this is the left ventricle. This is the right ventricle, right ventricle, left ventricle and the interventricular septum. So what happens if there is a septal MI? If there is a septal MI, what happens? There can be an interventricular septal rupture. Okay, what is that first one? Interventricular septal rupture. Okay, what happens? It is an interventricular septal rupture. So what, what does it mean? There is a communication between the left ventricle and the right ventricle. Okay. So what happens between there is a there is a communication between the left ventricle and the right ventricle. Because of this communication, what does it look like? What is the connection between the left ventricle and the right ventricle called? It is called a VSD. Okay. This is called a VSD. Okay. What is this called? This is called a ventricular septal defect. This is similar to a ventricular septal defect, isn't it? So what happens? The blood flow moves from the left ventricle to the right ventricle. So what happens because of that? The oxygenation is affected. Oxygenation is affected. Okay. So what happens because of that? There is oxygen mixing. The right ventricle blood, the, there is oxygen mixing. The, the venous end and the arterial blood mixes. Okay. So the oxygenation will be affected. What happens? There will also be a pan-systolic murmur or a holosystolic murmur as we call it. There is a pan-systolic murmur like how we hear in ventricular septal defect. So the first one is interventricular septal rupture. Okay. So next one. What, uh, what is the second one? Next one can be an LV wall rupture. Okay. LV rupture. So what happens when the left ventricle ruptures? What happens if there is a rupture here? What, there will be blood leakage, isn't it? There will be leakage of blood into the pericardial cavity. Okay. When the, when the LV ruptures, what happens? There is free wall. This is called LV free wall rupture. So what happens when there is a free wall rupture? There is blood in the pericardial cavity. This is called cardiac tamponade. Cardiac tamponade happens. Okay. So the blood trickles into the pericardial cavity. Initially, it will be less, which is called a pericardial effusion. When the actually volume increases and it actually begins to compress the ventricular muscle, then it, it is called a cardiac tamponade. What is it called? It's called a cardiac tamponade. So one more MCQ question here. What are the features of cardiac tamponade? There is a triad, isn't it? What is that? Bex triad. This is a very famous question, very easy question that you can answer if you know this topic. So this is Bex triad. What is Bex triad? You will have hypotension because of the loss of blood. There will be JVP because of the increased pressure in the pericardial cavity. So it will put pressure on the right ventricle as well as the right atrium. So pressure will get reflected on the SVC and the JVP. So the JVP will be increased and the heart sounds will be muffled. Okay. Heart sounds will be absent, uh, will not, not be heard or it will be muffled. So why, is the, why are the heart sounds muffled? Because there is a lot of blood in the pericardial cavity. So you're not able to actually hear the heart sounds because it is acting as a cushioning between the ventricle and the pericardium and the chest wall. So you're not able to actually hear the heart sounds. Okay. So what is Bextride in cardiac tamponade? Hypotension, elevated JVP and muffled heart sounds. Okay. So what is the third thing that can get ruptured? Papillary muscle. Okay. So what does the papillary muscle do? The function of the papillary muscle is to actually hold the uh, valves, isn't it? It to hold the mitral valve or the tricuspid valve in place. It anchors it to the ventricle wall. So what happens when the papillary muscle ruptures? What happens when the papillary muscle ruptures? You have the mitral valve or the tricuspid valve becomes leaky. So mitral regurgitation or tricuspid regurgitation occurs. So mitral regurgitation or tricuspid regurgitation occurs when the patient is having a papillary muscle rupture. Okay. Then what is the fourth one? What else can rupture? There can be a pseudo aneurysm. Pseudo aneurysm. What happens? So in this location, you can see that there will be a aneurysm formation. There will be a opening up of the ventricle, but it is not getting ruptured. There is just a ballooning of the ventricle, ventricular wall. So there is a pseudo aneurysm. What is this called? Pseudo aneurysm. What happens because of this? Uh, pseudo aneurysm, there is a lot of blood getting collected. So there is stasis. There is blood stasis. What happens when there is a stasis? There can be a clot formation. This is called a mural thrombus. 
It is called a mural thrombus. So what happens in 24 to 30, uh, 24 hours to three days? What happens? We have seen there, will be an in, there can be an interventricular septal rupture because of that a ventricular septal defect like situation occurs. Then there can be a left ventricular free wall rupture because of that you can have cardiac tamponade. Sorry. You can have cardiac tamponade. <coughs> cardiac tamponade. You can have a papillary muscle rupture because of that you can have a because of that you can have a mitral regurgitation or a tricuspid regurgitation. Mitral regurgitation or a tricuspid regurgitation. Then you can also have a pseudoneurism which can cause a mural thrombus. Okay. Because of the blastasis of the blood. Okay. So this is the clinical features. Then what happens in 3 to 14 days? What happens when it in the late later period? After 3 days, what happens? In the first 2 weeks, what are the features? Okay. What happens? The LV is not working properly. LV is not working properly. So because the LV is not working properly, what happens? It keeps on irritating the pericardium. What happens? It keeps on irritating the pericardium. So because of that, what happens when there are infected cells in that region, infected cells in the left ventricle, what, the, what happens? It keeps on irritating the pericardium. So what does it do? It gets inflamed. The pericardium gets inflamed. What is that called? Pericarditis. Okay. What is that called? Pericarditis. So what do we have? We have pericarditis because the infected or the inflamed cells are, are you know, irritating the pericardium. So there is pericarditis. So because of this, there is an amount of fluid leakage where we have pericardial effusion. Pericardial effusion is there. So in the first two weeks, what can happen? The patient can have a pericarditis or a pericardial effusion. Okay. Pericarditis or a pericardial effusion. So next. What happens less than one month? Two weeks to one month, what happens? 14 days to one month. What happens in the first month? This infarct. What, what happens to this infarct? The tissue. The body tries to, you know, uh, get accustomed to this. It tries to remodel the heart. Okay. So what does this do? There is granulation formation, granulation tissue. You must have learned in pathology. When there is a raw area, what happens? There is a granulation happening, isn't it? So granulation tissue comes. What happens then? There is a fibrous tissue deposition. There is fibrous tissue deposition. So because of the granulation tissue, there is a fibrous tissue happening on top of the granulation tissue. Because of that, what happens? This left ventricle will start ballooning out like this. Okay. So this left ventricle will start ballooning like this. Okay. What is this called? Left ventricular aneurysm. That what we saw was a pseudo aneurysm. In this, the left ventricle really, uh, really gets aneurysm. There is a di ballonic dilat balloon dilatation of the aneurysm. So what happens? Like we already saw, there can be a mural thrombus because of the stasis. And this can actually produce emboli. You can have emboli. You can have atrial fibrillation. You can have uh, emboli to the brain. Okay. You can have emboli to the kidneys. You can have emboli to the peripheral vessels. All these emboli can occur. Emboli can occur, happen anywhere. Okay. And it's not necessarily the brain. Okay. So you can have even in the kidney or the spleen or the liver, it can happen in any location. Okay. So what, what happens in the first month? 14 days to one month. 14 days to one month, what happens? There is granulation tissue. Okay. So there is fibrous tissue. This causes emboli. This causes emboli. So we have now revised what all happens in the cause of complications. So 0 to 24 hours, what all we see? Arrhythmia, sudden cardiac death, cardiogenic shock and pulmonary edema. 24 hours within the first three days, what happens? There are ruptures. Interventricular septal rupture, left ventricular rupture or the papillary muscle rupture and the pseudoneurysm. Within, within the first two weeks, there can be a pericarditis or a pericardial effusion. Within one month, what happens? You have an emboli. You have emboli. Because of the remodeling which is happening, there is an LV aneurysm that is formed. So because of that, LV aneurysm is formed. Because of that, there is an embolus formation. Okay. So you have now understood what are all the consequences or the complications of this um, ischemic heart disease happening in the heart. Okay. So let us now move on. So how do you diagnose? How do you diagnose this patients? So what happens with, rel with relevance to the ECG? And the troponins. In this, we are just going to see if there is an ST elevation or not. 
what happens to the troponin these are the important points that we should discuss okay so what happens in a stable angina i told you there is only a occlusion there is no there is minimal occlusion is there it is not a near total occlusion or a total occlusion so there is no st elevation no st elevation okay what happens to the troponin there is no infarction so the troponins are not released so there will be troponins will be negative okay so what happens in prince metal angina again there is transmural ischemia will be there so st elevation will be there but the troponins will be negative because there is no infarction there is only ischemia but there is no infarction so the troponins are negative what happens in unstable angina again there will be st depression and t wave inversion st depression and t wave inversion will be there but when you go and check the troponins it will be negative why are the troponins negative because there is no is in fact it is only an ischemia okay so there is there are no troponins but what happens in nstemi again there will be st depression with t wave inversion but this time around what happens the troponins will be positive the troponins will be positive because there is an ischemia infarction because there is an infarction what happens in stemi the stemi st elevation happens st elevation happens and the troponin will be positive okay and the troponin will be positive so we keep on talking about this troponins what are troponins you know these are all present in the muscular cell in the muscle cell when there is an infarction what happens is get released into the circulation so there are few other things which get released along with the troponins it can be ckmb or the myoglobin ldh or the ast all these things are also getting released what is the what what do we do because this this is getting released as these get released you know what we do we try to quantify these so that we can find out the duration of the or the time interval between the infarct and the diagnosis or you can see the severity of the disease all these are very very important okay so we are now going to see the what are all the parameters that get elevated and how is it helpful okay so the first one to rise and fall okay the first one to rise and fall will be first will be myoglobin okay so it is not of any clinical importance because it rises so fast and within 2 hours it falls down so we are not able to actually detect it at a fast rate okay so the second one is ckmb and troponin ckmb and troponin these are more or less similar they increase in with they come to the blood circulation within 3 to 4 hours they reach its peak within 3 to 4 hours but there is a difference between ckmb and troponin okay what happens the ckmb comes back to its normal levels earlier but troponin takes a long time to come back so as you can see here the troponin takes a long time to come back but as you can see the ckmb is coming down faster okay so here you can see the tree, troponin takes a lot of time to actually come back to normal but the ckmb is coming back to normal here itself okay so what does this mean this means that when a person is having an mi today you check the troponin levels and the ckmb levels will both will be increased you have admitted the patient and the patient has a second type of second uh, episode of ischemia and he says he is just having chest pain again but you are not sure whether it is an uh, stemi again or not whether it is an infarction again or not so what will you do that time you will do a ckmb level okay because it falls earlier the levels come back down to normal earlier so when you check it the second time it can be elevated but troponin uh, uh, the levels are still high for for a longer period of time okay so when there is a second infarction if you repeat a troponin again anyway it will be high you will not be able to differentiate whether it is a already existing um, infarction or if this is a new episode of infarction so ckmb and troponin are very very important these two are these three are more important clinically so myoglobin is just theoretical we don't use it regularly okay so myoglobin is the first to rise and first to fall ckmb and troponin they are more or less equal they reach a peak between 3 to 4 hours whereas ckmb falls down earlier whereas troponin takes a longer time to recover okay so troponin falls down to its normal level after a very long time so it is not actually useful in diagnosing it is not helping you to diagnose very easily okay so now uh, how do you say you will often hear the uh, cardiologist talking like what is the culprit vessel isn't it what is it called it's called the culprit vessel culprit vessel what is that culprit vessel once you see the ecg you need to find out which are the leads that are getting affected and what could be the vessel which is involved okay you need to find 
throat, which is the vessel which is actually affected. Is it left anterior descending artery? Is it the circumflex artery or the right coronary artery? You need to find out which vessel is actually affected. So what will help to find that out? We need to know the blood supply of the heart, isn't it? So just have a small recap of the blood supply. We'll just go fast on this. Okay. I'll just help you learn it in a better way. Okay. So what happens? Okay. So this is the LV and this is the RV. And this is the interventricular septum. Okay. This is the interventricular septum. Okay. So I'll use the green color for the vessels. Okay. So now this is the left coronary artery. Okay. So what does this do? The left coronary artery goes and supplies the septum. This is a septal branch. Okay. So what does this do? This is a septal branch. Then it also comes down and supplies the left ventricular wall, left ventricular lateral wall of the left ventricle. So what is what artery is this? Left anterior descending artery. What artery is this? This is left anterior descending artery. So the left coronary artery, the one, one important branch is a septal branch. It supplies the interventricular septum and the left anterior descending artery. Okay. So there is one more vessel which is coming from the left coronary artery, which comes down like this and supplies the lateral wall as well as some of the posterior wall. So lateral wall and the posterior wall. It comes as a round. Okay. So what is this called? Left circumflex artery. Okay. What is this called? Left circumflex artery. So what are the three branches which are important? This left, uh, left septal branch which supplies interventricular septum, left anterior descending artery supplies the left ventricle wall, lateral wall, then left ventricular, left circumflex artery supplies the lateral wall as well as the posterior, some of the posterior wall. Okay. So these three are very, very important. Now what happens to the right coronary artery? You will now see the right coronary artery. So what is the right coronary artery? You have the marginal artery. What is it? This is the marginal artery. It supplies the right ventricle, isn't it? It supplies the right ventricle. This is the marginal artery. This is marginal artery. What does it supply? This is the marginal artery. Okay. Marginal artery. There is one more, which is the posterior descending artery. What is this? This is the posterior descending artery, which supplies the posterior wall of the uh, posterior posterior wall of the right ventricle as well as the some of the posterior wall of the left ventricle posterior wall of the right ventricle as well as the posterior wall of the left ventricle so the left left coronary artery the important ones are the septal branches then the left anterior descending artery and the left circumflex artery on the right coronary side it is marginal artery and the posterior descending artery okay so we have seen what are what are the arteries which are most important and what is the uh, what is the area that it is supplying okay so now when you say there is a lateral wall MI, what is the artery that is included? Which, which are the uh, arteries which are included? Left anterior descending artery or the left circumflex artery? So you can say that is a left coronary artery lesion. Isn't it? Yes. So now coming to the ECG, what are the leads that you will see for which, which wall of the heart? Isn't it right ventricle or the left ventricle? So when you have a posterior wall, you need to see the posterior leads, which is actually the V5 to V9. V7 to V9 leads are more important in the posterior. V7 to V9 leads in the posterior wall. If you suspect a posterior wall MI, you should actually keep the chest leads behind and then check it. Okay. So that is posterior wall MI. So what happens in anterior receptal MI? Where will you look for anterior receptal MI? So you will look for the anterior leads. What are the anterior chest leads? V1 to V4. What are the anterior chest leads? V1 to V4. V1 and V2 are mainly septal. V3, V4 actually anterior. Okay, so anterior or septal, septal is V1 to, septal will be, septal will be V1, V2, anterior will be V3, V4. These usually go hand in hand because it is an extensive area which will get affected. So an anterior septal MI, then it will be V1 to V4 which is getting affected. Okay, coming on to the lateral wall, what happens when the lateral wall is affected? You will have lead 1, AVL and V5, V6 getting affected, lateral wall. That is 1, AVL, V5 and V6 will get affected in lateral wall. Okay. What happens in the inferior wall? It will be lead 2, 3, AVF. Lead 2, 3, AVF will be affected in inferior wall MI. So this is very, very important. As you can see, lateral leads 1, AVL, V5 to V6. It is either the diagonal branch of the left anterior descending artery or the left circumflex artery. If it is 2, 3, AVF getting affected, which is the inferior leads, 
then it is either a RCA or a, along with a left coronary left circumflex lesion. Okay. If it is an anterior septal leads, then it's V1 to V1 to V4. It includes the left anterior descending artery alone. Okay, left anterior descending artery. I hope this is clear. The blood supply, in short, as well as the leads that you need to look into to find out the culprit vessel. What is it called? It's called the culprit vessel. Okay. So moving on, what are the um, ECG changes that you will observe? Okay. Yeah, I would like to know if you want me to continue a little bit longer. Because I think it will take another half an hour for me to finish. I would like all of you to just comment in the chat box if we can continue or we shall have this for another day. Okay. You just please post your comments in the chat chat box. Okay. We'll just keep continuing. You let me know. We'll stop whenever you feel it's more. Okay. Yeah. So what happens in the first phase? So when there is an infarction, how does the body react? What, what do you find out on the ECG? Okay. What happens when there is an infarction? In the immediate phase of infarction, what do we have? What, what happens? How do we identify on the ECG? So what happens? You have a peaked T wave. What is this called? This is a peaking T wave. It will be very high and it will be very, you know, bit high, uh, high taller as well as wider. This is a high peaked T wave. Then what happens in the second phase? There will be an ST elevation. In the second phase, there will be an ST elevation. Then what happens in the third phase, that is in the phase two, the ST elevation starts decreasing. The ST elevation starts coming down and the T wave inversion begins. Okay. ST elevation decreases and the T wave inversion begins to happen. Also, one more thing that you can see here, you can see that the Q wave is occurring. Okay. What happens? A Q wave is being formed. Okay. A Q wave is being formed. There is an ST segment depression. The ST segment is coming down to normal. There's a TF inversion happening as well as a Q wave is happening. Then what happens in the next phase? The Q wave widens. The Q, the Q, Q wave becomes steeper. It becomes larger. Okay. And the ST elevation is almost gone. ST elevation is almost gone. And the T wave inversion is there. Okay. T wave inversion is there. The ST elevation is almost gone. And the Q wave is there. Q wave becomes deeper. Then what happens? The Q wave is still large. Okay. The Q wave is still there, but the T wave inversion comes back to normal as well as the ST depression, ST elevation. So what happens? ST elevation and the T wave inversion come back to normal. So the ST becomes normal, a T wave becomes normal, but the Q wave persists. Okay. The Q wave persists. This is what happens. This is very important for you to know so that you can age the infarction. In the first phase, what happens? There's a peak positive T wave. T wave is high and wide. In the second phase, there is ST segment elevation. The third phase, what happens? ST segment comes back to normal. That is coming back to normal. T wave inversion happens. And there is also a Q wave start beginning to occur. The third phase, what happens? The Q wave deepens. The ST is coming down to its normal state. And the T wave inversion still persists. In the next phase, what happens? The ST segment, is, ST segment elevation is gone. T wave inversion is gone. T wave becomes normal. But the Q wave becomes, uh, the Q wave still persists. Okay. So what happens? The Q wave still persists okay so now after ecg what do you do the most important thing the next thing that you do is the echo so what do you see in the echo echo what you will see you will see regional wall motion abnormalities what do you mean by that so if there is this is the left ventricle and this part of the myocardium is affected so what happens the all the other parts of the myocardium will contract except this region so the motion of this regional wall is affected what is it? The region of this motion, uh, motion uh, re regional wall motion is affected. The motion of this regional wall is affected. So what do we call that is called regional wall motion abnormality. You can say the septal wall motion abnormality is there. There is a septal wall is hypokinetic. What do you mean by that? You would have read such echo, echo reports, isn't it? Septal wall hypokinesia, left ventricular apex hypokinetic. That means there is an infarction in that region. Okay. So there will be regional wall motion abnormality. Then what, will, what else will happen? You will also need to look at the ejection fraction because the ejection fraction tends to drop. Isn't it? There's an infarction. The ventricle is not pumping properly. So there is an infarction. There is an ejection fraction decrease. So ejection fraction also, we need to look into that. Okay. So these are the two most important things that you need to identify on the echo. Then what is stress test? What is stress test? This is very, very important. In patients in whom you suspect an angina or an ischemic episode, but you're not able to corroborate it with the ECG or the troponin evidence. Okay. In such patients, what do you do? 
the patient when he comes to you he is normal but he says i keep having chest pain so how do you how do you actually diagnose this patient so you put this patient to a stress test okay stress test what are the two kinds of stress that you can do the first thing that you can do is first thing that you can do is exertion or exercise induced exercise induced stress test the second thing is pharmacological okay you give a drug to actually simulate this exercise so if the patient is having osteoarthritis and the patient is not able to do the exercise or a treadmill test he is not able to do it to actually produce these symptoms you are not able to do the test on him isn't it so what will you do you will actually subject the patient to a pharmacological stress test and the, what is the agent that is most commonly used that is dobutamine okay what is it called dobutamine stress echo that is called dobutamine stress echo dobutamine stress echo then what is the gold standard test you have done the ecg echo stress test but still all these may not be conclusive you may not know how much is the occlusion so to find out how much is the occlusion and what can be done for that what do you do so if you have an antraceptal mi okay so you know now you now know that the left anterior descending artery is getting affected but how do you know whether the other arteries are also affected because the atherosclerotic process is continuous it does not happen in lad alone it can happen in the right coronary artery it can happen in the left circumflex artery as well but it is not evidently seen on the ecg isn't it or the echo isn't it so in those cases what do you do the gold standard test is what is the gold standard test angiogram angiogram coronary angiogram okay what do we do in that we inject a we insert a catheter and you actually insert a dye and trace the coronary vessels you find out how much occlusion is there you can actually find out how much occlusion is there isn't it you can also find out how much occlusion is there and how the heart is functioning as well so what is why is it gold standard one is because you are able it is the best investigation of choice it is diagnostic and the second is most importantly it is therapeutic also so what happen while doing an angiogram you can as well do an angioplasty you can actually insert a stent you can insert a balloon and keep a place a stent in that so you can do it in one sitting itself so it is diagnostic as well as therapeutic okay it is diagnostic as well as therapeutic so this is very very important the gold standard test is angiogram okay coronary angiogram okay shall we continue yes so now a patient comes to you with chest pain and you suspect acs or acute coronary syndrome so before we continue with acute coronary syndrome i would like to ask you what do you think is acute coronary syndrome do you think stable unstable angina uh, n stemi all these things are called acute coronary syndrome no acute coronary syndrome is actually having three can unstable angina n stemi and stemi these are all called acute coronary syndrome these three are only called acute coronary syndrome stable angina is not stable angina and vasospastic angina are not a part of acute coronary syndrome so when you when you say that the person has acute coronary syndrome he must have either unstable angina n stemi or stemi okay so okay next move on so you have a suspicion of acute coronary syndrome you find that the person is having a persistent st elevation so what does that mean he is having stemi this is very very obvious he is having stemi okay but you see that on another occasion you see that there are no abnormalities on the ecg or there is an st depression or t wave inversion in that situation what do you do you check the troponin levels if the troponin levels are high so there is st changes or st depression is there plus trop positive what is this n stemi okay what is this n stemi isn't it this is n stemi if the troponin is negative troponins are negative what is this called unstable angina if the troponins are negative then it is unstable angina okay so this is unstable angina so i hope you have understood now st elevation stemi non st elevation is st depression or t wave inversion you check the troponins if it is positive it is n stemi if it is negative it is unstable angina okay yeah so coming back to the question this is a very excellent question i would like all of you to appreciate the question and you will find that whatever you have studied so far actually comes into fits into this question and you will be able to identify the answer easily i would like all of you to actually answer these questions so that it will be easy it will be a recollection also for you okay 
I'll read out the question again. A 75-year-old old lady comes to the OP with complaints of worsening fatigue, shortness of breath on exertion, and lower limb swelling since three weeks. She's a known case of hypertension and dyslipidemia. She gives a history of one episode of excessive warm sweating and nausea the previous week when trying to lift a big box. There is no history of chest pain, palpitations, or shortness of breath. She's a teetotaler. The pulse, BP are okay. There is a prominent JVP with pedal edema also. You have an additional heart sound with S2. After S2 with bilateral basal crepitations, echo shows there is regional wall motion abnormality over the anterolateral LV. Then EF is less, that is 34%. What is it now? The answer is very obvious. It is ischemic heart disease, isn't it? The answer is very obvious. It is ischemic heart disease. So, but why do we say that this is ischemic heart disease? So, you see here, there is exertional angina. There is exertional angina. Isn't it? Exertional angina. She also has features of lower limb swelling, which can possibly be because the right ventricle is not working properly. Okay. She has the risk factors of hypertension, dyslipidemia, as well as an age. Okay. A non-modifiable risk factor of age, hypertension, and dyslipidemia is there. So, you know the symptoms, presentation symptoms, and you also have known the risk factors. Okay. And she also gives episodes of excessive sweating and nausea. So, what are these? These are autonomic symptoms, isn't it? These are the autonomic symptoms. She's a teetotaler. So, one more risk factor is not, it's not there. There is no smoking, there's no alcohol. She's a teetotaler. She has three um, risk factors which are which actually contribute to the disease, but two other factors do not contribute to the disease, isn't it? Her pulse and VP are all right. There is a prominent JVP and pedal edema. So, what does this? indicate this could probably be a right ventricular myocardial infarction isn't it this could be a right ventricle wall which is affected okay you hear an additional heart sound after s2 with bilateral basal crepitations so why do you have this basal basal crepitations this is because of pulmonary edema okay this is because of pulmonary edema okay because of pooling of blood in the pulmonary circulation you have bilateral basal crepitations then what happens you have a sound after s2 which is s3 which will be heard okay then coming to the echo, what do we have in the echo? We have a regional wall motion abnormality and you have also decreased EF. So all this points towards ischemic heart disease. So why is it not long-standing un uncontrolled hypertension? If the patient is having an uncontrolled hypertension, the patient will have features of left ventricular hypertrophy, which is not mentioned in the echo. Okay. So if there is repeated vasoconstriction, what will happen? She will have repeated pulmonary edema. Isn't it? Repeated pulmonary edema will be there and there will be mixed oxygenation. So, oxygenation will be less. That is not mentioned. Alcohol consumption. We know that this person is a teetotaler. Okay. Also, in alcohol consumption, what happens? The patient is most likely to develop dilated cardiomyopathy. Okay. And what is this infection of the single standard RNA virus? Some like Coxsackie virus. Coxsackie virus. The patient can develop pericarditis. Okay. The patient develops pericarditis and these symptoms don't fit into pericarditis. So all these, as you as we can see, what is it? It is featuring towards ischemic heart disease. So this is a very wonderful question which I uh, which I came across and this is, I would like to share it with you. Okay. So now something very important from the exam point of view, this is called the Timmy score. What is this? This is called the Timmy score. This is very important from the MCQ point of view. This is actually some, uh, this is, uh, these are all the risk factors which actually points towards myocardial infarction. When the risk factor increases, as the risk factors increases, what happens? The risk for uh, myocardial infarction also increases. What is it? Age more than 65 years, more than three risk factors for uh, coronary artery disease like hypertension, hypertension, dyslipidemia, all those three, more than three risk factors for coronary artery disease, use of aspirin in the last seven days, if there is a known CAD, if the patient already has a prior stenosis more than 50%, or if there is more than one episode of rest tangent in the last 24 hours, if there is an ST segment deviation, it can be either an um, elevation or a depression. There should be an ST segment deviation and elevated cardiac markers, which can be troponins or CKMB. When all these, all these are there, you just mark it for one point each, okay, so that you will know the risk. So, when the risk is 0 to 2, it means it is low risk, okay. Then 3 to 4, it will be intermediate risk. What is it? 3 to 4 will be intermediate risk. Then what about 5 to 7? It is high risk. When the more the number of points, the risk for MI is more, okay. The risk for MI is more, yes.
So now we finished all the features of this uh, myocardial infarction. We now come to the treatment. Okay. So the treatment, I would like to classify it into three. Okay. The first one, what are we going to do? How are we going to treat this? We're actually going to reduce the thrombosis. Okay. How we are going to modify the thrombotic factors. So what happens? There are the, when the platelets come and get adhered to that plaque, there is a lot of products which are getting released to actually affect the internal milieu in that place. Isn't it? Okay. So the, what happens? The, the ruptured plaque will release some substances which will actually cause the platelets to come and get adhered. Okay. How does this adherence happen? It happens because the platelets also express some factors as well as the plaque expressing some factors. Okay. So the first thing is aspirin. So what does aspirin do? Aspirin will inhibit thromboxane A2. Thromboxane A2. So because of that, what will happen? The platelet adhesion will decrease. So platelet adhesion decreases. When the platelet adhesion decreases, the thrombus formation will not be there. Because of the decreased platelet adhesion, the thrombus formation will not be there. So the first drug is aspirin. Okay. Coming to the next one, P2, Y12 receptor antagonist. So what is that? You must have heard of clopidogrel, prasugrel, okay? And ticagrelor, ticagrelor, clopidogrel, clopidogrel, which comes in the brand name of clopilate, prasugrel or ticagrelor. All these, what do they do? They inhibit ADP. Some amount of little pharmacology is needed so that you will actually remember because these, come, these are, are used in daily practice, day-to-day -day practice. You see that the patient is on aspirin and clopilate. Okay. So you need to know why we are giving this. Aspirin inhibits thromboxin A2, whereas clopilate will inhibit ADP. ADP receptor binding. Okay. It will inhibit the receptor binding. Okay. So next is heparin. So we know we have given the patients intravenous heparin. Why do we give intravenous heparin? What does it do? It actually increases the antithrombin 3 activity. What does it do? It increases antithrombin 3 activity. Because of that, what happens? The thrombin activity. There is no, the thrombin activity will be reduced. What happens because of that? The clot formation will be reduced. Okay. Clot formation will be reduced. What happens? Heparin will decrease the clot formation because it reduces the activity of the thrombin. Okay. What does it do? It reduces the activity of the thrombin. Because of that, the clot formation will reduce. Okay. Next is the statin. What does the statin do? It will actually modify the LDL, decrease LDL and increase HDL. Thereby what happens? It will decrease the plaque formation. Decrease the plaque formation. I'm sure this is all just a revision for you. That's why I'm going a bit fast so that I don't have to spend so much time on the pharmacology. Okay. Aspirin inhibits thromboxane A2, P2, Y12, Y12 are a receptor that is clopidogrel. They will inhibit the ADP receptor binding. Heparin, it will decrease the thrombin activity. Statins will decrease LDL and increase HDL. So thereby decreasing the plaque formation. What will AC inhibitors do? They will reduce the BP. They will prevent cardiac remodeling. What will they do? Cardiac remodeling is affected. Remodeling will be affected. So thereby cardiac remodeling will be affected. So it will decrease the plaque formation or its effects, okay? Decrease the plaque formation and effects. Okay, so aspirin, clopilet, then clopidogrel, heparin, statin, AC inhibitors. This is most important. So coming to the next one. First, we saw this is decreasing thrombosis. What is the next one? Next one will be either to decrease the oxygen demand <clears throat> or increase the oxygen supply. So how do we basically increase the oxygen supply? We need to give vasodilators. When we dance, we dilate the vessel, what will happen? The more blood flow will come to the myocardium. So then all these symptoms will go away. The angina will go away because all the, uh, the blood will wash out all the reactive oxygen species, all that happen, all the toxic metabolites getting accumulated in that area. Okay, so what will happen? The pain will also get relieved. So the first one is nitroglycerin. Okay, so what happens to nitroglycerin? Nitroglycerin is a venodilator. You need to remember this. This is very, very important. What happens? It is a venodilator. It dilates the veins. So what happens? The peripheral resistance will reduce. The systemic vascular resistance will reduce. So because of that, what will happen? There will be lesser amount of blood that is coming into the heart. 
so there will be low bp so what the work the heart does not have to work more to pump blood blood okay because of that what will happen there will be decreased venous return so what what will have what will happen the heart does not have to work more and more it doesn't work it doesn't have to work hard to push more amount of blood so little blood is there it can push the blood easily so what does it do because of the venodilator the systemic vascular resistance decreases so the preload to the heart is reduced preload is reduced so when the preload is reduced what happens the venous return decreases so the heart the myocardium does not have to compress more and more to push out more blood when there is more blood the heart has to work more when there is less blood the heart works less okay so because of that the ischemia will be reduced okay along with that it is also a coronary vasodilator it is a venodilator as well as a coronary vasodilator what happens because of it's a coronary vasodilator it actually dilates the coronaries because of that there is more blood going into the heart okay more blood increased oxygen supply increased oxygen supply okay so can you tell me where one place this is contraindicated this is contraindicated in right ventricular wall mi because already the preload is less if you want to put a nitroglycerin and if you want to give a nitrate the preload will become even less further and the cardiac output will be very very less which will affect the patient so this is contraindicated in right ventricular wall mi you should not give it the, give it to the patient in right ventricular wall mi next is morphine so what is morphine morphine is also a vasodilator what is it Mor morphine is also a vasodilator it reduces the preload as well as the afterload because it's a vat arterial vasodilator okay so this morphine is a vasodilator next coming to beta blockers what does the beta blocker do it will decrease the heart rate like i told you because of increased heart rate when there is tachycardia there is an increased oxygen demand if you reduce the heart rate if you reduce the tachycardia then the oxygen demand also comes down isn't it so because of that we give heart a beta blockers how about oxygen if the patient there is decreased oxygen supply the patient becomes hypoxic so if you supplement the patient with oxygen he will improve drastically so the first one we saw what was it decreasing the thrombosis second is decreasing oxygen demand or increasing the oxygen supply so third most important one what is this this is revascularization okay this is revascularization how do you actually correct this disease all the above things that we give are actually modifying modifiable things how do you actually correct this process first thing this is percutaneous coronary intervention what is this pci percutaneous percutaneous coronary intervention okay percutaneous coronary intervention so what happens in this we catheterize the patient i mean we put a venous axis so probably the right femoral or the radial vessel we insert a catheter it goes up to the coronaries what happens you find that there is an occlusion in the lady what have you put a balloon inside that you push the balloon so that the plug gets pushed to the end then you place a stent in that okay so what are the stents that you place you place a stent the stent can either be a mechanical stent or a drug eluting stent okay so this is very very important drug eluting stent okay this is what we use most commonly drug eluting stent okay so coronary intervention it is very very important if it is done less than 90 minutes what is it less than 90 minutes if the door to balloon time is less than 90 minutes then it will be highly effective okay percutaneous coronary intervention okay you put an either a mechanical which is the bare metal stent drug eluting stent we use the drug eluting stent most commonly after doing this you give the you put the patient on antiplatelets you put the patient on antiplatelets okay and you decrease the possibility of rethrombosis so in which patients will you do cabg what is cabg coronary artery bypass grafting so there is an occluded vessel there is an occluded vessel you have here you have a thrombus what do you do you actually put a catheter you dilate this and you place a stent here isn't it but there can be one more way of approaching this what do you do you can do a coronary artery bypass grafting you actually take a venous graft or an arterial graft most commonly the venous saphenous veins are used you put a graft here you connect this area and this area so the blood will not go through this region but the blood will go through this pathway okay so you are actually bypassing the graft bypassing the thrombus so when will you do this you will do when there is a left coronary artery stenosis when the 
LAD, uh, when there's more than 70% occlusion in the LAD with more than two or three vessels involvement, when there's a triple vessel disease, or you've given maximum medical therapy, but the patient is not responding. In those cases, you do a CABG, coronary artery bypass grafting. Okay. Then the most common, what you do in the emergency setting, when you when you're posted in an ER, you will, uh, the, the cardiologist may ask you to thrombolyze the patient. What is this? TPA is thrombolysis. What is this? What is TPA? How do you expand TPA? Tissue plasminogen activator. Tissue plasminogen activator. Okay. Tissue plasminogen activator. So if you do this thrombolysis in less than or equal to 120 minutes, within two hours, if you're able to do this thrombolysis, then it will be highly effective. So what is the drug that we use? Altiplase. Most commonly, we use altiplase. Okay, they have tenecteplase as well as retiplase, but most commonly we use altiplase. It varies from institution to institution. Okay, but this has a lot of contraindications. The coagulation profile should be normal. The BP should be adequate. All these things, when all these prerequisites are fulfilled, then you can thrombolyze the patient. Okay, but still the contraindications are more. So the best is percutaneous coronary intervention. If it is a very severe disease and refracted to maximum medical therapy, then you put the patient for CABG. Just coronary artery bypass grafting, or you can thrombolyze the patient. Okay, thrombolysis less than 120 minutes. Okay, always PCA is definitely more more preferred preferred more than the uh, thrombolysis. Okay, yes. Now coming to this, just a small recap. You have a diagnosis of STEMI. If the if the center is capable of doing a primary PCA, primary coronary percutaneous coronary intervention, preferably less than 60 minutes, then you go in for this primary PCI. If it is if yours is not a primary, you don't have a cath lab in your uh, in your institution, or if you are able to refer the patient to a uh, place where there is a cath lab, then you immediately transfer the patient. If not, what should you do? If you think it will take a lot of time for you to transfer the patient, then you at least fibrinolyze. You do the fibrinolysis. You do the thrombolysis in the patient. So you at least do the thrombolysis in the patient and immediately shift the patient to a place uh, place where there is a cath lab. Okay, you shift the patient immediately where there is a cath lab. Okay, so this is what you need to remember as a medical professional passing out of MBBS is very, very important. This is very frequently asked in your uh, exams. Okay, now let us discuss some ECGs. I hope there will be some interaction for all this. Yes. So the first one, anterior wall. So what do you think, what do you find in this ECG? What do you see in the anterior wall leads? What do you see in the inferior wall leads? What do you see in the lateral wall leads? What do you find in this ECG? You can just put your comments in the chat box. I would like to have some interaction so that we can finish faster. Also, it will be interactive for you and it will be exciting for you. I have some good ECGs here. Yes. So what do you find on this ECG? Do you think it is an anterior wall MI or an inferior wall MI? Or a lateral volume. Yes. So, what do you see in this? First of all, you have some hyperacute T wave, isn't it? So, this is a very recent MI. This is very this is an acute phase. This is still in the hyperacute phase. You have some hyperacute MIs, hyperacute T waves happening. Then what is it? Sorry. Okay. Then what else do you see? You see that there is an ST segment elevation. Isn't it? There is an ST segment elevation from V2 to V4. V2 to V4. So what is this? The septum is also involved plus anterior wall. Septum plus anterior wall is involved. ST segment elevation and peaked T waves are there. So what do you find? There is some reciprocal ST depression. What is it? Some reciprocal ST depression is there in lead 3. So reciprocal ST depression in lead 3. Also, you have some Q waves here. Can you see? You have some Q waves here. Isn't it? So what does all this show? This is an anteroseptal wall MI. What is this? This is an anteroseptal MI. Androceptal MI. Okay. Yes. Moving on to the next ECG. 
So what do you find in this ECG? What do you find on this ECG? Yes. What do you find on this ECG? With respect to the ST waves, ST segment, T waves and the Q waves. What do you find in this ECG? You can find that there are very deep Q waves in this ECG, isn't it? There are very, very deep Q waves from V1 to V3 in this ECG. Okay. Along with that, what do you have? Along with that, what do you have? You have an ST elevation. You have an ST elevation. You have a Q wave, deep Q waves in V1 to V3. You have an ST segment, mild ST segment elevation. And you also have a T wave inversion. Isn't it? You have a T wave inversion in V1 to V5. You have a T wave inversion from V1 to V5. V1 to V5. Okay. So what is this? This is an old, this is a older MI. This is an older MI, mainly in the antero septal as well as lateral wall. Antero septal as well as lateral wall. Isn't it? Antero septal as well as the lateral wall is affected. So this is a septum, septum is affected, anterior wall is affected as well as the lateral wall. So you have deep Q waves, you have the ST segment depression which is actually coming down, you have T wave inversions. This is in the phase two to three, okay, of the ECG changes. Okay, so this is an old, anti older, antiseptal or lateral wall MI. Okay, next. This is a very characteristic, you know, spotter kind of ECG that you should find out. What is this? This is called tombstoning. This is like a tombstone, isn't it? So this is a tombstoning in the ECG. What is this? This means that the patient has an impending shock, impending shock and death. Okay. Impending shock and death because of proximal LED lesion. Proximal LED occlusion. Proximal LED occlusion. Okay, this is very, very important. In the proximal LED occlusion, because it's very proximal, there is a lot of a lot of segment of the and uh, left ventricle is affected. So you have this tomb stoning. This is a spotted ECG that you should find out. Okay. Yes. Mainly where is affected? It's affected in the lateral wall, isn't it? Mainly in the lateral leads as well as one AVL, AVL also, isn't it? So one AVL and you can see the lateral wall leads also. So this is a proximal LAD occlusion which is happening. This is tombstoning which is impending shock and death because of a proximal LAD occlusion. Now coming on to the last ECG. What is this? This is very easy one. I will tell you that this patient presents with hypotension. This patient may subsequently develop bradycardia also. So with that cue, you can also find out. You will get all these uh, questions and all this in the question and the clinical picture. Yeah. So what do we see? There is an ST elevation in the lead 2, lead 3 as well as lead AVF. Isn't it? There is an ST segment elevation in lead 2, 3 AVF. So what does that mean? This is an inferior wall lesion. Isn't it? This is an inferior wall MI. This is an inferior wall MI. Or what, or what more do you find? You also find a Q wave. Isn't it? You also find a Q wave in lead 3. You find a Q wave in lead 3. And what happens? There is a reciprocal ST depression in lead AVL. There is a reciprocal ST depression in lead AVL. Okay. So what does this indicate? This indicates that this is, this is an inferior wall MI. What is this? This is an inferior, sorry, inferior wall MI. Okay, lead 2, 3 AVF is affected with the reciprocal ST depression in AVL. This is an inferior wall ST elevation MI. Okay, yes. Now we come to the end. That's it. So I hope this session was very useful. I don't want you to mug all the, uh, you know, clinical features, the consequences and everything, all the complications and everything. You just go through this video again and again. You will be able to recollect everything in a sequential manner without having to buy heart because you have now understood the physiology and the pathology behind all this. Okay. Thank you so much for uh, being here. And we'll see, we'll meet further in the further classes. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. It was a very brief and elaborate discussion. 
the if you have any doubt you can just post it in the comments or we will send you a feedback form after the session in the group so that you can just put down your doubts over there so that ma'am can answer it thank you ma'am so let's have a let's uh, join again for a wonderful session from ma'am uh, probably in the next month thank you ma'am thank you so much kindly let me know what is the next topic so that i will post it in the group ma'am yeah sure thank you